Y Project today is now totally unrecognizable from its original aesthetic that is now largely attributed to Rick Owens. But what tragic story is behind this change and how did they recover to be one of the most loved labels in fashion today? To discuss Y Project, we first must discuss Johan Safati, the Y in Y Project, who launched a self-titled label in 2008-2009, which debuted with this spring 2009 collection that was meant to be a fairly genderless option with this darker, edgier aesthetic that was still growing in popularity at the time. Interestingly, there's actually a fair bit online about this collection after it was stocked by famous Japanese clothing store Amalga, which championed other designers like Demir Doma and Rick Owens, as well as many other well-respected stores across the world that saw the brand had a well-formed fan base even from this early stage. Even the New York Times commented on the collection's quality, as did several other blogs that I found from around this time. This success only continued for their following collections, Autumn Winter 09, Spring Summer 10, and Autumn Winter 10, which showed a continued aesthetic also to great reviews. This is when investor and friend Charles El Alouf got involved to fund the company as well as come on board as a director to help guide the business to becoming financially stable. As in his words, he saw how much mixing business-oriented people with creatives could be stimulating and fascinating. And quite frankly, he is right. It's very difficult to have one without the other. Just look at Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger, or Christopher Kane, his sister Tammy, or literally any designer picked up by LVMH that almost overnight sees profits explode when they see business, financial, and structural guidance. And in fact, it was this combination of both Safati and Al Alouf that allowed them to avoid this and stay independent as a company, even to this day. So, it really seemed like Safati had a great future ahead with this dark and neutral toned, heavily leather clad, pattern played menswear aesthetic. So he launched two brands from this, Y Project and Advitam, as basically diffusion lines. I couldn't find anything online about Advitam, but Y Project, which too was funded and co directed by Charles de la Louvre, launched in autumn winter 2011 with this set of garments that do exactly what a diffusion line does. Similar clothes to the main line, but less labor intensive or in different fabrics, which in this case meant that it was fabricated in wool instead of leather and was therefore also at a lower price point. But by literally the following collection, spring 2012, Y Project had also employed leather in their collections as well. And it seems that it's really here that the brand financially took off because in fall 2012, this was the first of any of his brands to have a full catwalk show. It was a simple affair with these translucent sheets held up by wooden frames that the models just simply hid behind until it was their turn to walk. I don't know if this was the perfect materialization of the brand image personally. For me, black fabric or just plain white walls would have had the same budget and maybe been more on brand. But still, it was a great marketing move for the company as it clearly had a positive impact on sales and exposure for Y Project as the budget for the following show clearly shot up and was far more on brand. Spring Summer 13, which is my favorite of Safati's physical shows because it's the most theatrical, hosted models on hospital beds wearing sleep masks in a way that gives us more insight into the way that Safati wanted his brand to be perceived. You can see firsthand how they wanted the brand image to look as dark and edgy as their clothing also suggested. This point of view was then significantly expanded on by his biggest show yet, Autumn Winter 13. The show was a full affair, meant to catch the eyes of the fashionable people. It was electric, dark and moody, and worked so well at explaining his version of fashion to his now greatly expanded circle of fans. But behind the scenes, things were not quite as good. Safati had contracted cancer, his health was failing and his body began to give out when just three months later, Safati would succumb to his illness at just 47 years old. Obviously, following the death of a namesake designer, many houses of this size would shut down, but because of the company's success and because Jarz El Alouf, the other founder, was still looking towards the company as something that he had invested in, the company actually chose to still go ahead with his Spring Summer 14 collection, just in a lookbook, while they searched for somebody who had the skill set to continue the company. In Ella Lou's own words, they were looking for a designer that understood the essence of Y Project, yet could at the same time take it in new directions, because they wanted the brand to constantly evolve. 
They consulted the Champ Syndical for potential successors, and the Champ had the perfect recommendation. The previous first assistant to Safati, Glenn Martins. Glenn Martins, who had been at the company before in 2009, before going away for other projects, like to begin his own label in autumn winter 2012, which would fold just three seasons later, shortly before he returned to Y Project after being recommended, would debut his first collection in autumn winter 14. Martins was a safe bet for the company. He knew Safati's design style well, and he was already a tested designer for the label, as well as having a long history with them. So this choice they knew wouldn't alienate their current audience, but could authentically continue the work that Safati had begun. However, Martins had other plans. He kept his first two collections pretty standard for the company, sticking with Safati's aesthetic, even down to the materials, but Martins had noticed that the target market for the company was well fed with other similar designers like Rick Owens, Andrew Mulemister, Demir Domer, etc., and therefore were limited to how much they could grow. This competitor analysis he did is 100% right. The market for that type of aesthetic is very saturated, and it is smart to carve out his own new aesthetic that customers can engage with. It's a better long term plan for any company, really. Better to be a leader than a follower, but I don't personally believe this is Martin's goal yet realized in Autumn Winter 2015, to be honest. Autumn Winter 15 is certainly slowly evolved, obviously to satisfy the company's stockists. I can see that in the fabric choices, but the trademarks that we know of Martin's work also aren't quite there yet. It's almost like this collection is Martin's silhouettes without the details, but also with Safati's fabric choices which give a unique collection for the company in a vision that really only lasts this one season. As by Spring Summer 16, he would really debut his own version of silhouette play for the company. In this collection, in fact, we get a lot of Martin's signatures. We get trench coats, the silhouette play, pattern play, denim, all while not abandoning the leather, which is still kind of known for Y Project, even now including the Y Project belt that featured throughout the Spring Summer 16 show. This collection is a huge achievement in its success of pushing the brand forward into the aesthetic that we know for it now. It's really interesting and yet commercial, proving undoubtedly to Jars et Lelouf that this would be an equally profitable point of view for the company. Martins was able to design in Safati's aesthetic and he had proved that, but his competitor analysis was what was able to motivate the company to produce their own design aesthetic that clearly worked. The media surrounding this collection was significantly more than before, as Martins had been able to transform this brand that had a niche following, mostly based in Japan, to one that was accessible to both an Asian and Western audience. In this interview with the New York Times, they explained that it was this collection that exploded the brand's revenue from 1 million euros to 3 million euros, tripling revenue from the previous year. They credit this to the inclusion of women's wear, but actually there has always been women's wear, even from the first collection from Safati. So what I actually think they're referring to is the Fashion Week placement into the Women's Wear Week in Paris, which actually debuted in autumn winter 16, just before the spring season came into stores. This goes back to something that I touched on in my Loverboy video, because as Martin saw an uptake in sales by including a show in the Women's Wear Week, so did Charles Jeffrey, despite neither brand having really a gendered offering and both being purposefully gender neutral. It's obvious that this placement of the product in Women's Wear Week not only brings more buyers, but more shoppers as well, who may be more likely to check out a name that they don't yet know if it is in their gendered fashion week, regardless of whether the product is genderless or not. In fact, Martin said that the collections were about 40% the literal same product, and yet we know from the sales boom that they sold significantly better. So by changing two of the four P's on the marketing mix, the product one with the wider appeal and the place of the product to the Women's Wear Week, the whole company got a huge lift in popularity, resulting in them being a runner up in the 2016 LVMH prize shortly after their Autumn Winter 16 show, and then the Andam prize in 2017 shortly after their Spring Summer 17 show. By this point, Martins had expanded the stockist list of Y Project greatly, going from 12 stockists in 2013 to 150 in 2017. Now Y Project was firmly recognized as Martins' brand, 
to the point that I think most people who know of them would be shocked by the start of this video to know that it really started as a diffusion line brand of a totally visually different label altogether. But really, it was almost like Y Project had been completely rebirthed with Glenn Martins as his own label, as he was living stockist to stockist with Jarzel Alouf, trying to make the company successful. He seemed to really genuinely treat Y Project as his personal own creative outlet, more than it seems that most other head designers do. Really, he'd grown this diffusion line label into one that far outshone the mainline brand of the previous namesake designer, and so through the seasons that came after this, from autumn into 17 all the way up to spring summer 19, he was building both his reputation as a designer and the reach of the company through his both consistent and creatively fresh designs, even bringing back some of Sofati's leather techniques into new fabrics, like this Spring Summer 19 scrunched leather technique that was used in his debut Spring Summer 09 mainline collection, and very regularly bringing back the standing collar, which was a signature of the brand in the very, very early days, including in the debut. Glenn Martins became a well-respected designer in the business, but his name wasn't really out there as much as it is today until October in 2020, when he would be named creative director of Diesel, which allowed him a freedom to experiment more fully with design because of the higher budget that a name like Diesel provides. Obviously, this was widely successful, and I do have a video on Diesel, but it's important to note that the influence of Diesel on Y Project 2, because it directly influenced people to engage with Glenn Martins, to grow, to know, and to enjoy his aesthetic, as well as Y Project, which was sort of a more refined version of his design style when comparing it to Diesel. This appointment drew many people to Y Project as a brand. You see, Martins was effectively using Diesel as a diffusion line label where he would try out these new ideas in less quality fabrications to allow for a lower price point, after which he would then transfer his ideas to Y Project with their more luxurious manufacturing production line. This was most notable in the inclusion of Trompe d'oeil, which he initially used in his Diesel debut, Spring Summer 22, and then significantly heightened this for his Autumn Winter 22 Y Project collection, which included this Autumn Winter 22 Jean-Paul Gaultier collaboration that was done in conjunction for his takeover with the Jean-Paul Gaultier Couture line show, all of which used Trompe l'oeil. This collaboration with Jean-Paul Gaultier does give us some insight into where his inspiration came from, because Jean-Paul Gaultier, the man, had become very well known for Trompe l'oeil in the 90s, with I think the first instance being in this spring-summer 1992 collection, where these three models don suits printed with half-naked people on the back. Could be wrong that this is the first instance, but I looked at a shocking amount of shows to find this as the first instance, and this was just the earliest thing that I could find. But it is well known that this, whenever it started, if it was in the Spring Summer 92 collection, did evolve into a real staple for Jean-Paul Gaultier, with their most famous now being the one that inspired Glenn Martins for his takeover in Autumn Winter 22. That being Spring Summer 96, which had these bodies printed on it through lines or dots and was famously worn by Robin Williams. This collection went fairly viral on TikTok, at least it was all over my For You page, and the collection as it hit stores really seemingly sold fantastically well. I for one have really enjoyed seeing all the looks on my feed and so it seemed to really further the Y project reach and mass appeal to Gen Z. Actually, it is kind of here that you can see a slight shift in the Y project universe as they further abstract clothing into Spring Summer 23. If you do take the term loosely, Abstraction or play has been a part of the Y Project brand with the pattern play that Safati was known for being an abstraction on shapes and textures, which was then furthered by Martin's version for the brand that further abstracted pattern pieces for clothing and included more variation on silhouettes. So now, to add trompe l'oeil, the design is able to further question their customer's understanding of clothing textiles and give the customer something that they have already proved that they loved and keeps the brand consistent in the eyes of their customer, which therefore makes Y Project seem like a bankable and reliable investment purchase. This is then taken further for the Spring Summer 23 collection, in which we now have a great example of all the brand signifiers that have been developing over the years. We've got trompe l'oeil, denim, pattern play, genderless clothing, silhouette play, trench coats, leather, even the Y Project belt. I'm so genuinely glad Y Project has developed in this manner because it has been a fair while since they innovated their image. 
So this really came at the perfect time to cause an extension on their product lifecycle chart, reinvigorating interest in the brand for so many. Furthermore, they also in this same collection had their really successful collab with Fila that brought Pat and Play to a more sporty aesthetic, which definitely would have helped introduce the brand to yet another new customer base that may not have yet heard of or seen something that they can relate to with Y Project, making this season not only a peak for the Y Project identifiers, but also another successful diversification of their product offering. Which leads us into their recent Autumn Winter 23 show that just showed in Paris. The collection as a whole was a real championing of all of the identifiers we've come to know, continuing that Glenn Martin's Y Project aesthetic that is so successful for the company. This, in general, has been a nice breath of continuing rise for a brand that so far has been nicely unproblematic and not conforming to the recession core aesthetic that's been so prevalent this season. I'm nothing against Recession Core, of course, I recently praised Burberry for it, but it's a great example of something I mentioned before about Martin's finding his own design language for Y Project that doesn't need to rely on trends to be successful. He's a leader, not a follower, and this collection is a real example of that. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. I recommend watching the recent Burberry video if you are after another video right now, or check out my beauty channel that does this but for beauty brands, and check out my Patreon if you'd like early access to future videos.